All right, I want to welcome everybody to another episode of the Shadows Podcast. I'm your host, Trip Odenheimer, and today as we are rolling along with our October episodes, I'm really excited to have with us today Michael Bailey Smith. He is uh, an actor. He has an extensive resume. Uh, if you check out IMDb, I believe it's over 100 uh, films and, and TV series that he's a part of. The military veteran, we'll get into that as well, and then uh, correct me if I'm wrong, also the Vice President of Global Sales for Lexi? Yes, sir. Yeah. All right. And so he's joining us today, sir. Thank you for being here. Thank you, sir. No, uh, thanks, Trip. I appreciate it. First of all, you got a great last name. So it's better than Smith. Well, it's, it's very strong German name, but I would yeah, yeah, have very Smith good. when I'm filling out any form. Yeah. Plus, I have to comment you on your haircut. So you got a pretty like, good haircut. Yeah. I was going to say, I like yours, too. I like yeah, yours, too. St. Berber. Yeah, exactly. Dollar shave. Yeah, That's what I tell go. people. Well, yeah. tell our listeners, where are you joining us from? Uh, Dallas, Texas. So an apartment in downtown. Just uh, finished a, a divorce after about 28 years. And so uh, I took a dart and threw it and uh, it hit downtown Dallas. And that's where I live. So it's, it's where I love it. So it's great. So Yeah. And you have some history there, too, as well, uh, which we'll yeah, yeah. get yeah. into with your story. Um, yeah. But no, I, I appreciate you taking time to do this. I'm excited and we're going to get things started here with um, which is kind of a, we, we have a fantastic four member on here. So we're going to have our fearful five uh, questions that we're going to get started with. Okay. First one, book recommendation for our listeners out there. Oh, you want to recommend some books? Do you have a book recommendation or a, or even a podcast recommendation that you would recommend to someone? Uh, I. I, I don't know. That's kind of a surprise. I don't know. I, yours. Let's just listen to yours. All right, we'll go with that. There we yeah. go with that. Shadows Podcast. Let's do it. You co-signed that one. So there you go. Yeah. What advice would you give 15-year-old version of yourself? Oh, wow. Uh, sheesh, that's a good question. But I haven't ever asked that question. I was waiting for like a deathbed uh, question. Like, what are you going <laughs> to say on your deathbed? But at 15 that's years old, it's a little bit different. I, I think, you know, don't be so hard on yourself, Ah, but you know what? It's okay to be hard on yourself because I think that really drives you to want to be better. Right. So I, my whole, I'm going to get emotional about this. And I always talk, when I talk about this, I get emotional is that I, I don't like to do anything half-ass, you mm -hmm. know, I don't, I hate being average. I don't want to be average. You know, I know people that like to be average and like that. I don't, I want, I don't want that. I want to be the, try to be the best at everything that I do. And, and so I think, um, you know, if I was going to say be hard on myself, I think that's, that's probably the wrong thing. I, I think that helps being hard on yourself. Um, I, I, one thing I think uh, is to really try to enjoy your family and friends more. Sometimes I get caught up with work too much. I don't call people. I just started to doing that recently. You know, I'm, I'm getting to be down the road a bit here. So, you know, there's some people aren't going to be around anymore, including me. And so I'd like to be able to say hi to somebody like I'm going to L.A. next weekend and I'm going to meet up with some friends that I've seen in, you know, 10 years. And it'd be great to see them. So I think that's a big thing is, you know, and your and your parents, you know, and your family just in general, you know, your brothers and sisters like, the, you know, don't ignore that. And uh, that would be my advice. Don't get caught up with some work. Make time for them. So, yeah, so I'm getting emotional already. Yeah, uh, this is good. This is good. And <laughs> speaking of, you know, that that drive for for success you're talking about and being the best, how do you measure success? Uh, for me, it's an, an internal um, it's internal gauge that I have that, you know, because. It's so not so much that I always want to be the best at what I do and be the recognized as number one, but knowing that I've given it everything that I have, that I have left nothing left. I have nothing left. Mm -hmm. Right. So I learned that a big lesson when I was an actor, you know, I wanted to win every role and I was pretty lucky at winning most of the roles that I did, I, that I auditioned for. But I also, um, you know, you learn this later is that you only have control over what you do when you walk inside the casting office, when you're reading anything beyond that is out of your control. Cause you could be looking like somebody's cousin that they hate or someone's ex-boyfriend that they hate, or maybe you don't have enough name. There's a lot of things beyond just how you read as an actor or how, how good you are as an actor that, that affect your, you getting a role. And so that used to kill me. And after a while, I just, you know, um, yeah. So I think that's, you know, just, uh, 
you know, knowing that, uh, you know, that, uh, I just give it the best I can give. And, and then I walk away and say, yeah, I did a great job. And that's, that's all you can do with, and you know, and plant seeds and whatever you do, if mm. you're in a regular, if, right. If you're doing, you're at your job and if you're doing the best you can do and you're working your ass off, guess what? Your work ethics is going to pay off and someone else is going to recognize that, you know, freaking trips, a badass dude. Let's, let's hire that guy for something else. And that's happened to me a million times, not only in acting, but in, in you know, in the business world as well. So, it's, yeah. it's always, yeah. so always try to give, do the, do your best at your ability. Don't do anything half ass and, you know, don't be average. Yeah. The plant and seed piece is really crucial. I think because my daughter's going through something similar. She's in high school right now and she's finding out the harder she's working, the more she's doing, the more she's being rewarded with, with yeah. some of the yeah. extracurricular uh, things she's doing. It's like, you know, my son, you know, went into the military and, uh, you know, my older son, and he's, he ended up being, a in the 75th Ranger Regiment, you know, a special operations guy, the whole situation. And, and I told him when he in the basic, I said, listen, I said, I said, here's what's going to happen. And anybody that's been military knows this. Uh, there are so many dudes that join the military just enough to get by, right? Get that paycheck, right. do whatever, spend their paycheck on some bullshit stuff during the weekend. And they're living paycheck to paycheck and they're just doing enough to get by. That's it. I said, yep. don't do that. I said, that's what everybody else does. I said, do the extra. I don't mean you got a brown nose or kiss ass. I don't mean that. But you just be the act you go the extra mile and whatever you do, and you'll get recognized. And he ended up uh, graduating top of his class in basic, top of his class in AIT, recognized as one of the top guys out of RASP, a Ranger Assessment and Selection Program, and then also in Ranger School. So, and he got invited to do some other interesting things, you know, that I really can't talk about. But one thing was kind of cool is that he got out and now he's playing division one football yeah, you know, in central Michigan. So, you know, that's just, again, don't be average. Range so easy to be average. average. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Awesome. No, that's, that's it. What is something you do that makes you lose track of time? Oh, wow. Writing. Um, writing. Yeah. So I, besides being an actor um, and I've, I've kind of stepped away from the acting biz for a while. So uh, focusing on my, my, my uh, business career, um, doing that and heading up sales worldwide for this startup that I just jumped to. But I also, I also write and I started writing when I was an actor um, and uh, I write screenplays. I've written about 10. I have uh, ideas for about another 40 or 50 that I've written down log lines and things like that. And I just had a screenplay option called yeah. my good boy and it's going to go into production next year. So a uh, pretty, pretty well-known producer just optioned it. And uh, yeah, it's uh, pretty cool. So it's a, it's based on a little bit about my life, uh, you know, growing, growing up being picked on and beat up um, and then using football to kind of gain your respect and then having that taken away in an instant and then getting caught up with some, bad dudes in Detroit and doing bad things to bad people. And, and then how realizing that this is not the right road and trying to get out of it. I mean, I literally had people sitting on my car. One dude sat in my car one night, you know, with a nine, nine millimeter sitting on his lap. I carried a 45 and he pulled out his nine. I pulled out my 45 and we stood and stood and looked at each other. And I were about maybe 10 yards apart. And, you know, we said some words back and forth and uh, he just said, I got you, man. And that, you know what that means? That means, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, like, I'm going to freaking waste your ass. And, you know, I, I, you know, I tried to be all hard and stuff like that. And he walked away, hopped in his car and drove off with his guys. And, and uh, I got my car, my freaking hands were shaking, going, I'm like, fuck this, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm not dying for this shit. So it was, it was, uh, got crazy. But yeah, so that that screenplay is about that story and how getting out of it. And then, you know, I, you know, because I was picked on, I use a lot of that the anger towards people. And it was great for football. I bet yeah. the beat, I mean, I was known, I might not have been the most talented guy on the football team, but I put my head through your chest in two seconds. You know, I, I knocked, I knocked the shit out of you. No, no problem. And so that kind of, you know, translated into doing other things in Detroit. And, uh, and so, um, yeah, so uh, and, and stories about now your son's getting picked on and beat up, and how do you prevent that same thing having a slip yeah. break cycle? So that's why I got options. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, that is cool. 
Wow. And it, you're a pretty big guy too. Like I stood next to you and you towered over me. So I'm, I'm trying to imagine <laughs> someone trying to pick with you. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, when you have a nine, that kind of equalizer, right? So exactly. Exactly. <laughs> that's why, they, and, that's why dudes carry them. <laughs> well, final question for you before we get into your journey, what is something that you fear? Uh, um, I don't feel failure. I don't do that uh, because there's a saying that they say in Silicon uh, Silicon Valley, a lot of tech startups guys, and this is kind of a, a, a what do you call it? A I don't know what to call it. Some kind of a people say, and that is, there's there's you're only winning or you're learning. Mm. You don't fail. So when you fail, it's not really failure. Just hey, what did I do wrong? And it's to go at it again, and then keep doing it until you win. And so just basically winning and learning is what you're doing. And so. Um, what was, what was the question again? I was, what was the fear? Question? Yeah, so what I fear. So I don't fear that at all. Um, I fear that I don't have enough time to complete all the things that I want to complete. Okay. I have a lot more stuff to do. Yeah. You know, I, I want to I wanna make an impact with my writing. Uh, I want this startup I just jumped to. I want to be able to, you know, take that to $3 billion. And, you know, I want to do that. There's a lot of things I want to still, and I don't want to, and I feel like I'm on the backside of life and I'm, you know, instead of, the, I'm not 30 anymore, you know, or 20 thinking, oh, I got all day. I can just watch, play video games all day. And I don't do that. You don't find a video game on my computer or on my phone. I have no time for that. I'm going 90 miles an hour. And I think that's the fear of running out of time. So Okay. Yeah. Well, you're in the shape of a 20-year-old. But, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you, you survived our Fearful Five questions. Now we're going to actually jump into your story. I like so this, you, actually. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good way to, good way to get... Loosen it up a little bit. So you yeah. were born November 2nd, 1957. Uh, 64 and, years old. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. 64 years old. And is it Alpena? Did I say that right? Alpena, Michigan. Yes. Alpena, I, Michigan. Supposedly I'm the most famous person out of Alpena, Michigan. So someone called me from Alpena or emailed me and said, hey, we want you in our parade. I'm like, what? I'm not gonna be <laughs> <laughs> on the float. <laughs> you need the sign that says when you enter the city that this is home of Michael Bailey Smith. Oh yeah, right. That'd be funny. I would freak out if that happened. So yeah, know. anyone listening in Alpena, go ahead and make that happen and give them a key. Like, the yeah, that's what someone told me. I was the most famous. I said, "You guys are hurting if I'm the most famous person in Alpena." <laughs> but I think at Eastern Michigan, I'm ranked uh, top five or six of most famous people out of that's graduated and went on to something, you know, whatever. I think there was an astronaut and there was a, a Senator and some CEO, whatever, you know, just a sh schleppy actor. So whatever. I'm not even the most famous person in the building I work at, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you, you were in a military family, your father, as you said, 30 years in the yes. air force. What was it like growing up as a military brat? Uh, well, I mean, you, uh, you know, as anybody would know, that's been in the military, especially for a long period of time, as a as a as a you know dependent uh, military brat, that you don't keep friends very long. You know, as towards you try to, but it's like anything, right? You you have you know childhood friends that you you meet up with and you know, on the base or you know like at Nellis Air Force Base, we lived off the base because that's there was no really no base housing. Uh, Wordsmith had base housing and things like that, but you you know. Uh, you get to know people, but then you move, right? And that's what happens and you kind of lose. So there's really no hometown that you have mm -hmm. and there's really no long, long-term friends. Uh, that's, you know, that's, uh, that's, that's the one thing that that's interesting about being growing up like that. But the other side too, I got to travel around. I, I did my high school in Iran, in the Middle East. And not, not too many people can say that they're, uh, you know, that uh, they graduated from the U.S. Embassy where they held uh, 50 American hostages, you know? That is uh, great. Yeah, so I, le I learned a lot living there. My, oh uh, boy, my my first my first couple nights, you know, I'm I'm walking down the street and like, it was kind of 10 o'clock at night with my sister uh, and we're both, and you know, this is in the seventies. So my sister's in a halter top, you know, whatever. She's a teenager and I'm walking with her and then some guy walks by and grabs her just some Iranian dude grabs her and then we get in a big fight and if you know, turns into a rock fight at night, you know, I have been in a rock fight at night. You don't see the rocks coming at you. Well, good thing Iranians can't throw very well, but I used to be in baseball. So I was tagging dudes at about 50 yards. Wow. <laughs> it was good. 
but that that's you learn those things. I got my my first knife pulled on me in, in in Tehran, you know, in the capital city. I took a taxi, and the guy turned around when I got me, you know, fairly to my location. And one rule they told you um, when you're a Tibet dependent there in Iran is that you never tell anybody your exact address. You stop like two or three blocks away from your home, yeah, um, and then you get out and you make you know wait till they drive away, then you go walk the rest of the way. So there's a you know. There was there was in Iran it was a big culture clash you know between trying to be everybody modernized to the you know to the old old ways, and so there was a lot of conflict there. So, wow, yeah, it was and, great. Still cool, yeah. Still a great experience. Well, you actually when you graduated, you started working for a little bit, right? For what was it, Westinghouse? Westinghouse, yes, sir, yes, sir. Uh, I worked for Westinghouse. Uh, so Westinghouse was a big contractor there, and they built defense radars for the Iranian Air Force. And so they were looking for laborers, and there was a guy there his name Dennis Soprenit, this big, huge, freaking yoked out dude who played high school football. Oh, and and by the way, they had high school football in Iran. So in, in my really? school, Toronto American School, was big enough to have three football teams, uh, full, you know, like fifty people on the team, whatever, fifty guys on the team, whatever it was or more. And then they had a community school which had a football team as well that had uh, Americans as well as uh, Iranians on it. And then they had that, and they had three football teams, and I was on the Vikings, whatever. And I made it to the All Star team, and in the All Star game, I, you know, I remember intercepting a pass and running it in for like the inch yard line. And I guess my, you know, we tied the game at the last second, and uh, we ended up losing it. It's crazy because the kickoff or whatever. But um, I had a, the the coach there. One of the coaches come up to me, and said, "Hey, Michael, I have to tell you, said you have the ability to play college football." And I've, something I've always wanted to do is play college football. And so when he yeah. told me that, I'm like, wow, really? Thank you, coach. I appreciate that. And then it's kind of stuck in my head. And so then I went to I went to my dad and I said, hey, you know, I want to I want to play college football. And I said, well, that means you're going to go to college. And that means we can't afford it. So you're going to have to figure something out. You know, when you're a sergeant with six kids, you know, they don't get paid a lot of money and afford me to go to college this ain't gonna happen and, and I wasn't a you know I wasn't Einstein in school so I wasn't getting a scholarship and no one and I even though I was good at football no one's gonna recruit you out of Tehran Iran right some college they're gonna go there and recruit you so uh he said uh why don't you join the military and said uh, and he goes you could join the air force and I said nah I don't I don't, I don't do that I, don't, I, I thought about the marines but there were four years I want to do something hardcore and so I wanted to be an army ranger <laughs> And so it's funny, my dad flew me from Tehran to Frankfurt, Germany to go talk to the recruiter. And I went, I said, I want to be an army ranger. And they go, they looked at me at 6'4", 160 pounds. And he went, yeah, you're not going to make it. <laughs> like, Come on. And so they said, uh, I said, no, you're not going to make it. And uh, um, and so he said, but there's uh, slots for um, airborne school. You can be a paratrooper. I said, all right, I'll do that. So uh, I wanted to sign up for 11 Bravo, the infantrymen. That's what I was going to do. And I went back with, um, this is funny. I went back. So they flew me back from Frankfurt back to Tehran to meet my parents. And then um, my dad says, okay, what was your MOS? And I said, well, it's 11 Bravo. That's infantry, right? I said, yeah. He goes, hell no. He called up the recruiter, change his MOS now. So they, they in the, and then, so he says, give him something that needs to use his brain. <laughs> and so he <laughs> not that the hell. <laughs> uh, infantry guys can't lose their brain. Of course they can. What but, rank was your was your dad at this time? Uh, he had an E eight, E eight or something like that. Okay, he was up there. He he, he could sw he could swing a little bit, right? So yeah, um, he called and uh, this is the Air Force guy calling the Army recruiter, and so uh, you know he was kind of running the show over there in Iran anyway. So. Um, they said, well, they have a slot open for 24 Mike, which is a Vulcan, Vulcan weapon system repairman, whatever. So that was my MOS. And so I was a 24 Mike and, and then uh then I was a paratrooper. So and that's that's so I went. So I went back and I then I worked nine months. I did uh delayed enlistment, whatever. I think mm -hmm. it was halfway through. I delayed enlistment and then uh I worked I was working at Westinghouse at the time, building a defense radar for them up in the mountains. That's that was trippy. Uh, working up there in the mountains uh, because it was a blizzard or something, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Well, you did some research there. Yeah, we got caught we're up in a blizzard. Yeah, so we got we got uh, caught up in a blizzard, and uh, wow, um, we ran out of food. 
we had some soup left with uh, some rice we found from a, a, a shack, a shepherd shack. So they had shepherds, you know, with the with the, the sheep and things like that yeah. that passed by. And then we're on top of the Azor Mountains. This is like way on top. So and it was above the frost line and also like that. And it was it was crazy. And it snowed. It was like it you got a blizzard of snow to send. We couldn't get out. They tried to get a bulldozer up there. It broke. The blade broke. So it, tra- it blocked the road. Uh, they couldn't fly anything in. So they had about 15 of us stuck up there. Um, I think it was 15. A bunch of engineers. Most of the guys were out of shape and fat, you know. So we decided we need to walk down. And so they tied like a bunch of these ropes together and we're walking down. And me and this other young dude were in front. And we're poking holes into the road, making sure we're not walking off the cliff because we didn't know where the drifts were at compared to the road. Well, one of the engineers had a heart attack, fell in the snow. Another guy gave him like the mouth to mouth, revived him. We helped him all the way down the hill and got down there waiting for it. It was like a quote quasi rescue party. <laughs> this Wow. And this was what they gave us after like being up there for two weeks. Uh, they gave us vodka and bread. So I was wasted okay. all the way home. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say. Yeah. So, right. yeah. So then I did, I, I, you know, I did that. Um, I saved $17,500 there. And back then it was, it was uh, tax free at the IRS a bit, you know, because back then there was like a limit, you know, when you work overseas, you don't, you have to pay for taxes or some kind of craziness like that. Yeah. So, um, I watched the IRS come after me, but I just said that. But uh, uh, so then, yeah, so I, I went into the military and did, did that whole thing uh, for three years and got out. I have 34 jumps. So on uh, all them, com- I had a couple of Hollywood jumps. Yeah. But uh, yeah. You were at Fort Bragg, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It was good. Yeah. It was a great honor to be with the 82nd Airborne. Yeah. I, I used to live in uh, Lumberton right up the road. Okay, I don't remember. I just remember Fayetteville, and I remember Vietnam. Uh, yeah, Vietnam. Agreed. Uh, agreed. Uh, and my and when I so understand that back in the day in the Vietnam era, I was post Vietnam. My right post Vietnam was seventy seven to eighty. Uh, but right then there was in the eighties, the eighty second. Their nickname was the Jumping Junkies because mm-hmm. there was a big, huge drug problem there. And so the 82nd and 101st hated each other, of course. You know, that always happens, right? In mm-hmm. unit, when you're not fighting, you know, the actual bad guys, you're fighting each other. Yeah. And so uh, there was a lot of that going on. But my my uh, platoon sergeant was a pimp, was a straight up pimp. Yeah. He was a pimp, ran a, ran a, a whorehouse off, off, right off post called, uh, called the Black Velvet or the Velvet Touch. Velvet Touch. I could tell so you. So many questions about, about that. that. Huh? Wow. I said, I have so many questions about that. Yeah, he was straight up, straight up pimp E six, and he was a pimp. And it was he was that was cool, man. So we had my the first, uh, my uh, you know when they, they bust your cherry, you know when you first get into the unit, right? Your first jump. Well, there was a little bit more than that. <laughs> you know yeah. what I'm talking about at the Velvet Touch. So, jeez, imagine winning a quarterly award in that. that <laughs> wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, then we had like a we had thing. Uh, part of that whole thing was uh, when you got in and you're new. Not only you get your first jump, you know, to, to pop your cherry, but then also we had two things where you had to. So we had these wood. We did. We stayed in old division in 82nd. So I don't even have those anymore where they had these old like Korean or Korean barracks. So they had the the, uh, the two story with the the like the small roof on the, on the coming out the window of the second yep. story. So they would make you get up there and crawl up there and then jump off and do a PLF. This is when you're wasted. So, and then at the top of the stairs, you had the, they had like a whole bunch of guys, like three or four guys, all the old sergeants and things like that. They're in your barracks. They were in their lawn chairs. Everybody's drinking. We had a big 55 gallon barrel. I mean, 55 trash can put a 55 gallon trash can, put uh, uh, liners in it and then poured every liquor possible, you know, in it with a bunch of fruit and things like that. So everybody just drank that big tra- called trash can parties. And so, we had that. And so you get pretty lit up and then we jumped off the roof. You had to do that. To, and then they would judge you on your PLF. And then you had to roll down the stairs. You wouldn't stairs three times. You had to roll three times on the stairs and come to the bottom. So uh, one of the guys broke his arm. Uh, the first sergeant was very pissed at that because <laughs> now you're hurting. Government I can imagine, yeah. Yeah. So I'm trying to picture like six, what, six foot four. Yeah. Yeah. 
version yeah. of you rolling down those stairs. Yeah, that yeah, I was I didn't get a good score, so that's for sure. And then and then the the one when I jumped off the roof, my it was it was basically face to knees, like bam, and my nose just exploded. You know, it didn't break it, just blood everywhere. They were cheering. They were like, Yes, good job. And so it was good. My have, times have changed in the oh, military. You can never do that nowadays. Oh, I know. No. None yeah. of none of what you said starting from pimp on. Uh, <laughs> would, would fly now. Is, that, is that crazy? Is that crazy? Or is that crazy? Believable, but yeah, it's 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 really great. And so you did three years in yeah. the military. Looking back at your military journey, what was the biggest thing you discovered about yourself? Uh, definitely pushing yourself beyond what you think you can do. Yeah. Uh, I think you know my biggest thing was because I had these big ass long legs and running. I had a tough time, you know running in formation, you know, and every, and then you're and in the 82nd on Mondays, you would run what four miles on Mondays by Wednesdays. It was, um, I think it was, you'd run five and then, you know, then we'd run like a 10 mile run, like, you know, later on, we do that once a month, a 10 mile run or whatever. Right. And that's, we do like a whole battalion run or a company run. We go through, uh, up this one hill, a bunch of tank trails, We'd go through and run straight up the hill, and I'd always like be lagging behind because my big ass, you know, my big old long legs weren't good with this, and and so I I just learned you know endurance and run like I could be able to run like a deer after I got out. I trust me. So I went when I went yeah. to East when I went to Eastern Michigan to play football, they couldn't believe how fast I was and how far I could run, and didn't bother me, you know. So it was pretty cool. So I joined the military weighing 165 160 pounds at six four. Okay. I could take my arm, my hand, and reach around, touch the other side of my arm. That's how skinny they were. Yeah, I was like very slim. Yeah. Yeah, I got out weighing two forty. Wow. So I went through back in the day, Joe Weider crash crash weight gain paint cans, one of those a week, and I, I was in the gym every time I could get. I was we 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 got deployed somewhere. I was doing push ups behind tanks and gamma goats. You know, back in the day when they had gamma goats and and in my foxhole and doing whatever I needed to do. I was just working out all the time. So yeah, I was like max it. PT tests and all things like that. I didn't, I was just a freaking, I became a physical specimen. It was pretty cool. So, yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned it, it parlayed over into Eastern Michigan where you go there. Yeah. And- I walked on. So I, so I had a chance to go to Notre Dame. Uh, so chaplain Gimple was a chaplain in my unit, uh, captain, uh, Badass dude, big, huge guns hanging out of his uniform. He was a, a all American linebacker at Kansas State and went to seminary school and went to the military. Okay. So he was the smoking, the only smoking, cussing, and drinking chaplain. And I know, and he was a badass dude. He, I remember one time I was on uh I was on some kind of guard duty. We any second sometimes we go to the uh White Sands missile range, drop in there. The white sands and it's right out there on the mexican border and sometimes they'd give you like a few rounds in your you know in your weapon and they say you know sometimes there'll be coyotes coming across meaning you know mexicans coming across with you know drugs or whatever and just in case you get a little crazy you know whatever and do the whole halt stand to be recognized all that yeah. you know crap they tell you to do right um and <laughs> rumor has it that there was this he was the captain was walking out there in the middle of the night and caught this one like private or fr- private first class smoking a dube out there and he snatched that dude and he made him he made him see jesus pretty quickly but but this guy but this guy come up to me and he says uh hey and i was a corporal at the time he goes hey corporal smith he goes i understand you want to play college football i said yes sir and he goes uh, I, and i said sir i heard you played at kansas he goes yes sir and he goes he goes yeah i did corporal and he goes uh he goes hold on for a second let me make you let me make a few phone calls and see what happens so he gets back to me about two weeks later he goes he calls me in his office goes, corporal smith Talk to Notre Dame, and uh, they would love to have you. They, uh, I told them about, you know, how you can run, you're strong, you're how big you are, and things like that. I said, all right, and I said, cool. I was all set to go to Notre Dame. And I Notre Dame was a really, really big program at that time. Yeah, that you know, that's the you know, it's like the it was this would be after Rudy, right? So, yeah, um, this is seventy nine, yeah, seventy nine, uh, or maybe beginning of, beginning of the eighties. Um, right beginning of January. Uh, Montana, Montana era, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah I, I don't remember, but yeah. So I, I didn't really, I had no, I heard about Notre Dame, but you know, I just wanted to play football. I don't care if it was on where it was. I didn't care. So then he calls me back in his office about a few weeks later. He goes, he goes, hey, I was thinking, I was thinking Corporal Smith. He goes, you know, go to Notre Dame, probably ride the bench for a while. He goes, 
uh, where are you from? I said, well, I was born in Michigan, sir. He goes, let, let me see what I can do. Calls back. He goes, listen, I looked at the paper and Eastern Michigan sucks. They haven't won a game in you know, <laughs> years. Um, I, I gave him a call and they, they want to see you. So I took, I said, okay. So I, I took a few days to leave. I flew up to Eastern Ypsilanti. I was standing in the hallway, ready to meet the head coach. I'm sitting like a parade rest almost, you know, pretty strack, you know, sitting there. And then also the online, and I'm prepared to tell the uh, head coach, I want to play tight end and defensive end. That's why I played in high school. And I was really yep. good at it, you know, fast and things like that. And the O-line coach walks by me and goes, hey, you that paratrooper? I said, yes, sir. And he goes, I need a, I need a center. You want to play center? I said, I'll play anything, sir. And he goes, all right, you go in there and tell me you're center. That's how it started. So wow. at 6'4", Keep position, huh? Key position just to be thrust into. Yeah, so so I, I backed up. I didn't I wasn't I didn't start. So um I I backed up uh this guy named uh, Chris Vibini who ended up going to St. Louis Cardinals before they became, you know, Arizona Arizona uh, Cardinals. Um but backed him up and then um and then uh I as I got bigger, I went from 240, 250, 260 then the my I was went from the guard and then I went to uh went to tackle and I was weighing about 285, 290. And how I got recognized by the NFL was I had a, I was a I registered in my freshman year, which helped me out a lot because I had to learn this. I didn't learn how to play football again. All I could right. do is one thing. I would hit the living shit out of you. That's how I made my name. And that's and that's to and that's to anybody that wants to walk on. I don't care who you are. As I, I just told my son, who was a ranger, who's uh, at Central. I said that you just got to go fly around. People, coaches love that. If you can hit, they will find a sp spot for you, period. Yeah. They will find a spot on special teams, next thing you know, whatever it is. They will find a spot. And that's what I did. I, I would just freaking, I'm kamikaze. And so um, I, so my redshirt, freshman year, I didn't play. My freshman year, I, um, I was on special teams. And I flew down and made a couple, I made like three or four tackles, blew the wedge up. Akron used to have the wedge. And then this, this guard who's starting guard was having trouble. And so they called me in on Monday and said, you're the starting guard. I was starting at guard playing yeah. against Illinois and uh, got my ass kicked the first game, but uh, I learned a big lesson and I just started getting better and better. And I got bigger and bigger. And, and by the time my, my, my red shirt junior year, they had, NFL teams came and because I was eligible for the draft, I went and, and ran around, right? And I ran a four eight, weighing almost two ninety. And that's unheard of back then. Yeah. And that was freaking fast. And I, I was squatting over six and benching over five. I was curling three fifteen straight bar. Three three plates on both sides. And I was putting over my head three sixty five, seated three sixty five. That's how strong I was. I was freaking yoked and uh and fast. And so I got on everybody's radar. And so then I started getting all these letters from all the NFL teams. They came to my practices leading into my senior year. And then I hurt my hurt my knee right before the first game of my senior year on a fluke. Um, some another lineman lost their guy and shoved him into my leg and dislocated my knee and all this stuff happened. I, they put it back together. I wore a brace and then the coaches said, listen, you have an option of either getting uh, surgery or or and getting away for the draft or playing on it. I said, of course, I'm a team player. I'm going to play on it. Yeah. That only made it worse. So uh, by the end of the season, I wasn't even starting. I was, I was in so much pain. I couldn't start. I couldn't hardly play. And um, plus there's a whole mental thing when your knee is bad and you're getting into a block and blocking somebody, all of a sudden you see the lineman coming at you, you know, and they hit you and your knee dislocates, you know, it's, it's not a fun situation. So got it fixed after, uh, and then, uh, I was supposed to get drafted. Uh, they said between the third and fourth round didn't happen. Uh, and, uh, I had an agent at the time it didn't happen. And so, but the night, the, the, the night, the last person was called for the draft, bam, bam, bam on my apartment door. And it was a scout from, uh, a recruiter from the Cowboys. He said that he had been on a lot of my practices and he said, you've been signed yet. And I said, no. And, uh, he said, so we want to sign you. So I went, I went to the Cowboys and I was there for about a week and a half, two weeks, tweaked my knee and it blew up like a freaking huge basketball. And next day I was doing well too. 
And uh, the next day I got called into Tom Ran Tom Landry's office and yep. he says, Michael, we love you. You know, cause I could long snap too. He said, uh, I was going to, I was backing up Tom Rafferty to the center and he said, we love you, but your knee's not going to make it. We got to let you go. Wow. So I went back to Eastern. Part of that. Yeah. Yeah. Went back to Eastern, you know, floundered around for about a, a year or so, year and a half. That's why that screenplay is about that whole time period. Mm -hmm. um, but then I got my my mom called me, <laughs> bless my bless her soul. She called me and said, "You need to get your shit together and finish your degree." So I finished it in uh, computer science and chased some girl out to California, um, uh, and that lasted about a month in San Diego. And I befriended an uh, awesome dude named Steve Hedenberry, who was like. Mr. Wisconsin, uh, he was playing Conan up in Universal Studios. He was into the acting thing and doing all yeah. those things. And so he was kind of showing me the ropes and uh, he said, hey, I have this audition for this movie. And I was big, I was into bodybuilding time. I competed a couple times. And he said, I have this uh, audition for this movie called Nightmare on Elm Street, part five, playing a bigger version of Freddy Krueger called Super Freddy. And he said, uh, um, why don't you come with me and uh, we, you know, maybe you can audition and, you know, we'll go to Gold's gym after and train yeah. chase some chicks on the beach. I say, Hey, it sounds good. I was working at Xerox and uh, at the time uh, debugging software at a, in a cubicle, nothing against cubicle jobs, but that's not me. And yeah. I'm just not going to stare at a cubicle all day. Not going to happen. And so uh, uh, I asked my boss if I could take off and she says, no, I said, I'm going anyway. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I did. So um, I got in the car the next day and drove up to literally Los Angeles. And it was literally on, we're on the one one I could see the Hollywood sign, that famous Hollywood, you know, in the hills. And, I, and then we got out on Hollywood and Vine and saw the, the, the uh, Walk of Fame and the Brown Derby and all these famous landmarks. And then we went to the, I'm like, this is freaking great. You know, some freaking stupid ass kid, me, you know, from Michigan now in Hollywood. This is crazy. Right. And, uh, and so he auditioned and then they asked me if I want to audition. I went in and it was this, uh, the director was named Stephen Hopkins. And he's like, so Michael, have you seen those Freddy Krueger movies? And I said, yeah, of course. And he goes, all right, so I need this big guy. His name's Super Freddy. He's supposed to laugh and get scary and all those things like that. He goes, so we, uh, I want you to laugh. So I get out this big laugh. laugh and he goes, that's fucking awesome. Guess what? You got yourself a job. I'm like, oh, wow. Uh, I, I, I work at Xerox. We're going to take a few days. Off. <laughs> and that's kind of how it happened. And so I got in front of the camera and I can say faster than a bastard maniac, more powerful than a local madman. It's super funny. And this whole, you know, my big three lines and I got my SAG card. Uh, and I, I said to myself, this is what I want to do. Yeah. I love, I love the excitement. I love it. It's like, reminds me of playing football, lining up against some dude who's gonna, who said he's going to, it's fourth and inches and you need to block, knock the shit out of this guy ahead of you. It's the same thing. You're putting yourself on the line. It's like being yeah. in the military. It's the same thing. You got to perform when they call you to do it. Right. It's the same. I love it. And so I, I quit my job. Uh, I got a, I got a flunky job at this, uh, not a flunky job. I got a, uh, it was at a test laboratory. I lied on my resume. I'm probably going to go to hell for that, but I lied on my resume to get the job that had all this experience. I didn't. Uh, I just said one thing I could work outwork anybody. That that's if you can outwork anybody, that's what, that's what I did. And I, I worked like 18 hours a day just to learn and on my own time a lot of times. Mm -hmm. um, and I wasn't good at the beginning, but I got good. But then at nighttime, I spent all my money that I made on acting classes. I slept in my car for about two or three weeks and then found an apartment with some weird dude in Hollywood. I slept on the floor with a blanket. And, all, and everything I owned in my car, everything I owned, I could fit in my car. I was very proud of that. I was that mobile. Yeah. yeah. And so then I put everything in that room and slept in the back room. And until I made enough money and got my own place. And, and uh, yeah, and that's kind of how um, I just started doing it. It took me, after I did Nightmare on Elm Street, it took me about a year and a half to land my next role. I had to work, you know. And while I was doing that, I was hustling. I was, I had this. I had a manager who was giving me out on these weird gigs and some of them were really weird, just weird things like showing up in costume to do at a premiere or, or delivering submissions to casting directors and doing that every freaking day in the morning from seven to about nine and I'd go to work. Then at nighttime, I'd go to acting class. That's what I did. I, you talk about people say, Oh, you go to Hollywood to party. 
there's no time for partying. And I was at the, and I went to the gym every day, you know, make sure I was shredded and, and make sure I was ready for what I was gonna be ready for. And that's kind of how it happened. And, and that's, uh, and then from there, I, I landed the next movie called CIA Codename Alexis and B movie, but I ended up just supposed to be a fight scene, you know, and end up being the fourth lead in the film because they gave me a bunch of dialogue to say, and I was good at doing that. And they just wrote me a bunch of shit. It was great. And I got to, I uh, bought Lorenzo Lamas and had some scenes with uh, OJ Simpson before he killed his wife and, and a bunch of other things. It was cool. And then it went from there. I did the fantastic four, you know, the Roger oh, Corman version of that, you know, I played Ben Grimm. It's clobbering time, you know, that, that guy. And um, you were actually bigger than the thing. Yes. Agreed. 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 But that, yeah. but it's the whole thing that I My first sitcom was Murphy Brown. Yeah. I played one of her famous secretaries. I, how old people are, are that are watching now, but that's a pretty back in the nineties. That was very prestigious, uh, top rated sitcom. Yeah. And, and I, and they actually added an extra scene for me because they really liked what I did at the beginning. And again, it pay, it goes back to always trying to do a great job on everything you do because the mm -hmm. stuff pays off. It just does. Don't ever do anything half ass. Always do the best you can do. And if you do that, people will recognize it. People and people will, people will reward you more ways than you can count. And that's kind of how it happened. And then I ended up doing what? Uh, uh, I've done, I don't know how many TV shows, but episodes wise, probably, I don't a know, a 60 or 70. And then I don't know how many movies I've done, 40 or 50 movies. Charmed. Yeah, so I did two years on Charmed. And that started with just a co-star role. Yeah. I did a really good job in a co-star role. I mean, I, I did a character um, and it was called, uh, was, I was playing this Grimlock and the AD come up to me during filming and says, Hey, Michael, can I tell you something? I said, yeah. I said, he goes, uh, the director was commenting on how you are probably one of the most talented actors he's worked in the last probably five years. Hmm. I'm like, me, you mean me, you're talking about me, this, this guy, the big ball headed kind of goofy dude, me. And he goes, yeah, you, I'm like, I said, uh, he said, I said, wow, thanks. And so, you know, I, I appreciate that. It humbles me that people would say something like that. And I've had that happen a few times, but I let it slide off my back because you never want to get caught around. I think I'm a badass, you know, whatever. Yeah. Well, guess what? At the end of the show on the Friday, we shot all week. Uh, my manager calls me and says, hey, they want you back. I said, same character? He goes, no, different character. They, they were, you're going you're to replace this other guy that, that wasn't working out. So I became Belthazor. Who was the probably their the top demon at Charm? I did that for two years. Kind of that Darth Maul look to him. Yeah, yeah, agreed. So yeah, so I did that, and that's kind of how the whole thing how things started. Again, good work gets work. It's, yeah, that's that's the thing in everything in life. You know, your your job in the Air Force, good work gets work, right? Any everywhere. Very true. So. When you said that he had you doing some odds and end jobs, I was like, please don't say pimp. Um, no. <laughs> but. <laughs> with, with the, uh, a couple of things I want to ask you about before we get to uh, that awesome chainsaw sitting next to you. Uh, with with the Freddy role, how long did it take you to actually film that Super Freddy part? Uh, well, there's a couple of things about that that's quite interesting. Uh, so not only a couple of days. Yeah. You know, there was first I had to go get the 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 fitted for the suit, and the, there's a picture Black I have gray. posted on Instagram. Yeah, I posted on Instagram. It was like the wardrobe fitting for that. And then I met with Robert England uh, one day. Awesome. Yeah, agreed. Super nice guy. Uh, and talked to him about, uh, about um, um, I was going to say, talk to him about uh, Freddy Krueger and how, you know, I should play him and things like that. And then, uh, then I got the prosthetics fitting, you know, done. And then, uh, and then, uh, yeah, then I, then I did like two days of actual stuff. They, they put squibs on me and the, the original suit, as you saw in the, in the, there's a picture on Instagram I have of me pre prosthetics and it doesn't have a lightning bolt across it. I, I don't yep. think it does. And the reason it didn't originally have one, but then what happened is they put squibs underneath my shirt. And so when I say faster than the bath, you know, these they're shooting, the guy across me is shooting at me, the mass marauder, I think he's called, um, the shirt catches on fire. And so they had to somehow quickly fix it. They cut out a big black lightning bolt and stuck it on my shirt. So that's why that bolt. was on there. Yeah, yeah. So because that always stood out to me, the black lightning bolt. But yeah, yeah, agreed, makes... agreed. And so that, yeah, so that that was great. And then on the last day of filming, I'm I'm standing there, just because I I love being on the set. You don't know, like most actors are in their trailer. I don't do that. Yeah. 
you'll always find me in a chair on the set watching. I love watching. I watch. I love watching actors and just how great they are and just stealing, trying to steal stuff from them, like techniques or whatever, you know, mm-hmm. that. Um, but then also watching the crew and, you know, and good craft service, you know, that's always good. But I just like being involved in the mix. And I was standing there kind of watching what's going on. I look over and I see the casting director and the director talking. And normally the casting director is not on the set. And I'm like, it's kind of strange. And so they kept talking. They're looking over at me, talking, looking over at me. I'm like, oh, gosh, am I in trouble? And then the director comes over and goes, hey, Michael, so uh, I have a question for you. I said, yeah. He goes, what do you think about doing a love scene? And I went, as super funny? And they go, no, no. So the movie is called Dream Child, right? There's a, there's a, the, the Freddy's going to come yep. to the dreams from the baby. Well, the girl needs to get pregnant. And so the opening scene is two people making love. So the star and the, the two stars, male and female, need to be making out. And they're not, and then you get naked. And so we need to find some body doubles. We need some with a muscular back and you'd be perfect. I said, if you're going to pay me, I'm, I'm up for it. So they paid me and, you know, it was good. So that's kind of how it happened. Lap, lap pulls paid off. I yeah. just, uh, you know, in my first role, I'm like, man, I, you got to love Hollywood, right? You got to love Hollywood. Stuff like that happens. So, yeah, it's pretty crazy. Talk to us about the Fantastic Four because there, there's so much, like, just controversy around, around that movie. And yeah. I saw the documentary, Doom. Um, yeah. Wh- good the listeners out there who are not familiar with it tell them about how this movie was filmed it was not intended to be released there was trailers for it that were being released just everything yeah. that went yeah. on with that yeah so that happened i think in two uh 1992 i think it was or 1993 i think it's when they started coming, yeah yeah so um so in the beginning of december i had an audition for this movie so i was doing at the time i was doing a tv show called renegade with Lorenz Lamas and them. Um, and, uh, and they said, Hey, you have an audition. So I had a couple of days off. I, dr- I drove from San Diego where Renegade was filmed up to Los Angeles. And I auditioned for this movie called fantastic four. I knew about it. And I played, you know, for this character named Ben Grimm. And so I read and then they called me back on the weekend to read again with the director, which I did was Ole Sassone and I read with him and, I end up getting it. So it's really stressed. Okay. When's it going to film? I'm thinking like in, you know, January and January, like, cause Hollywood normally shuts down in December, right. In part of January, but I said, no, you're going to start filming at like January 27th or 28th. I said, that's very strange. I mean, I mean, December 28th, right before it. Yeah. yeah so December 28th or 27th, I forgot right before the year turns. And so we started filming and we just saw it, all of us, Alex Hyde-Y, Rebecca Staub, uh, Jay Underwood, everybody, Joseph Culp, uh, everybody uh, thought this is just a normal film, it, low budget, but an action film. And at the time, there was other low budget films done too, like Captain America, Punisher, and things like that. There were Marvel comic films that were low budget. And mm-hmm. so, but during the filming, guess who came to the set? Uh, Stan Lee came, came to the set during the, the part where it's the... It's downtown. I run into Alicia Masters in the film and I pick her up, whatever. Stan Lee's there and he sh- he comes over and shakes my hand and he says, uh, Michael, I have to tell you when I you, you're what I had in mind when I created Ben Grimm. And I said, wow. I said, thanks. Thank you. You know, Mr. Lee. Oh, man. I know this is from him. This is from the guy, you know, and I'm like, wow. He goes, no, you're doing a great job. We're, we're very excited. Uh, at the time that Marvel Studios hasn't been formed yet, you know, I guess it was just starting at the beginning stages of it. So we ended up, you know, finished filming. We still hadn't, I didn't have it, and the rest of the cast, I think maybe Alex maybe did, Alex Hyde-White. He's more connected, and he comes from Hollywood royalty. His father's Wilford Hyde-White, you know, a very famous actor. And so he, um, so we finished filming, and we went on to other projects, but they had a, sh- they, we also found out that there was a, uh, that the director put together a trailer and it was going to be shown at the Shrine Auditorium at a comic book festival. So we all showed up at the cast and we're sitting in the background and the line to wait to see, to see this trailer was out the door around the corner, down the street and around the corner. It must've been like half a mile. Maybe not that long, but pretty, pretty long, a quarter of a mile. And 
they all packed into the Shrine Auditorium and they watched the trailer. And there was a standing cheering ovation for the trailer when it was finished. It was really good. I'm like, wow, this thing's going to turn out pretty good. Alex turns to me and he goes, we got to do something. And I go, what do you want to do? And he goes, we got to hire a publicist. We need to do this. I said, okay. And then I I did um, all my acting coaches were mainly through this one gentleman by the name of uh, Jeremiah Comey. Great actor. Uh, uh, very uh, kind of a method uh, slash, uh, I forgot the other type of uh, technique. But anyway, um, and so he always told me, when you get your first break, you need to take all that money you made and stick it back into the film and promoting your your film, doing whatever you can to get yourself to the next level, you know, get some more visibility. So I'm thinking this is it. So I told Alex, I said, you know, he goes, I, he goes, I can't afford it. Can you help us? I said, yeah, I can pay for this publicist. So we hired a publicist and he started promoting the film. We went to comic. So he took us in the cast and we, we went around the country to comic book festivals, comic book stores. Uh, we went to children's, uh, uh, we went to a children's hospital. We did radio uh, interviews, all those things like that, promoting and showing the trailer. I was even on a plane once flying back from Florida with Alex and I convinced the, the stewardess at the time, flight attendant to put, actually had VHSs for the, the, the play on the, t- on the, the, uh, the TVs. Uh, Cause they only had, they didn't have it on your, your back of your seat. This had like, you know, several, right. you know, back in the day. And so uh, to play the Fantastic Four trailer on the plane, this is at 30,000 feet. Everybody's cheering on the plane. That was pretty cool. Yeah, so, I bet. Yeah. So we did all, all this hype going on. And then we, and then Alex and the whole publicist really did a lot of work. And um, uh, beginning of December, we had a premiere set up at the Mall of America. Um, and we had all these national and local radio and television affiliates coming in. We had Ronald McDonald House, Children's Miracle Network, all that tied into the premiere, all those things like that. And and then uh, Oli calls me and says, hey, I just got a cease and desist letter from from Bernard Eichlinger and 20th Century Fox. I said, what? He goes, yeah, they uh, they sold the rights to the Fantastic Four and it's shelved and there's no one's ever going to see it. I'm like, what? So um, uh, anyway, I could say a little bit more, but I might get in trouble. But anyway, uh, <laughs> some some interesting things happened. But uh, um, so they they shelved the film, and nothing ever happened. And so what happened is that then somewhere along the way, a bootleg copy got out of it, mm-hmm. and it ended up. I remember doing a. I was at a years later. I, I, when, I, when I did Hills Have Eyes, um, and it probably before this, but someone come up to me when I was doing the autograph signing for the Hills Have Eyes, come up to me and said, hey, here's a bootleg copy of the Fantastic Four. I'm like, holy crap. And they're all over the place. That's our movie. They're floating and, around. Now. Yeah. And now, now it's on YouTube and everything, you know, but that, that's what's going on. And so... Um, yeah, so then you know uh, Marty Marty Langford uh, was the genius behind, uh, and Mark Sykes this was the casting director and also producer for it as well. He was the original casting director for the Fantastic Four. They they were they were they're incredible, and they put together the the documentary and really detailing out. Yeah. And I have a bunch of memorabilia that I've saved and articles, and I've got original artwork that artists wow. have given me. Yeah, that's probably worth some money. Yeah, I have some. I have I have old original comic books that that are still in the cellophane that people have I just went through my stuff. So I went through a divorce. So I had this big box I went through. I'm like, oh crap, I haven't seen this in like 15 years. Oh, holy crap, look at this. Some really cool stuff. So oh yeah, I can't imagine. Yeah, no, I, I watched the the Doomed documentary and then I, which I suggest anybody go out there and watch. Casting I thought mm-hmm. was incredible for the movie. I thought it was really good casting for yeah, you know this was the same time that uh, Jurassic Park was released, right? Yep. Difference in a budget. Right? So, yeah, if we would have had the budget, you know, um, you only had a million dollars. It less than that, actually. Yeah. Yeah. So, but yeah. But the thing is, so and then also too, it's kind of a blessing in the skies to a certain extent because if there was bigger budget, they probably would not have hired us. 
Yeah. Well, they so filmed in the warehouse too, wasn't it? Like it was like a yeah, town. Yeah, in, in Corman's in Corman's warehouse down by, right by Gold's Gym, where I used to go train. Gym warehouse. Yeah, yeah, agreed, agreed. And now it's an apartment complex. <laughs> oh wow. Yeah. Well, so. well, it it worked out for you because you ended up filming Hills Have Eyes. And yeah, and years later. Yeah. So yep. yeah. Yeah. And it, it is curious to think like what would have happened to everyone's career had it been released when it was scheduled, I think, which is like January, February, 94, somewhere around there. But you did Hills Have Eyes. You were phenomenal in Hills Have Eyes. Um, the first, the Well, the, the remake and then the second one, uh, which tell us about that nice little award sitting next to you. And how was it to film that? Oh, this is a this is a Fuse, Fuse Fangoria Chainsaw Award. So it's got my plaque there. Maybe. That is so, yeah, cool. this is a. Uh, that is that's, cool. That's pretty. That's pretty cool. Um, that was for best for best bloodiest beatdown. And you beat out the Rock for that. Yeah, Rock and somebody for Doom. I think the movie was called Doom. And then there was another one, a Godzilla and T Rex. I had to beat them out there. You know, fake. Doom was a bad movie. Yeah, yeah. And then there was a couple. Oh, oh for Descent. Uh, Descent that came out same time Hills of Eyes did. That's a very. Uh, good. Yeah, that was a good movie. So. Uh, yeah, so that was great. Funny story about that. Uh, I took my appearance manager at the time with me named Bill Philput. He's a good dude, crazy guy. Uh, uh, he's like family. He's a pretty cool dude. Um, after the after party, I met, I got to shake hands with like Rob Zombie. He's really cool. I got a photo of him, me and him somewhere. And he's flexing on me, uh, which is pretty funny. I love when people do that. I mean, like, whatever, dude. <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, so we went up to this after party and we're sitting there and these phenomenally beautiful women just sit down all around me and Bill and they're gorgeous and they're like have hardly anything on and they're like holy crap this is freaking awesome you know I'm married I can't do it at the time I was married so yeah. married but they're like super friendly to me and talking to me and I'm like I you know I put the bill I said gosh is this because the hills of Ida? he goes no because they're porn stars I'm like oh <laughs> there you go. But, but guess who was in the bunch? Stormy Daniels. Stormy, Stormy Daniels, uh, Donald Trump's girlfriend. Oh, really? Yeah, Stormy, Stormy, Stormy Daniels. Well, they're not girlfriend, but fling or whatever you want to call it. But yeah, yeah. So, she, so she was she was in the group, and she, her, and I were talking, and you know, super nice lady, and beautiful, super super nice lady. Yeah. Uh, and she said, Hey, you know, this is back when I guess it was not Facebook, but what it was called FaceTime, my space, my, my you know, uh, let's, let's, let's connect on my space. And so we did, and we communicated a little bit. I wasn't going to do anything, but anyway, yeah. so that was kind of, that was kind of cool, but yeah. Yeah. Well, and you also men in black, uh, too, which that was a, a pretty cool scene where the, uh, was it the girl eats you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Laura Flynn Boyle. So, yeah, that that was. I normally don't do like. I mean, I'll listen, but you know, uh, there's there's no small parts. There's only small actors, right? That they always say. So, but you know, when Barry Sonnefeld calls your manager, says, "Hey, we want Michael for this role. You know, can he? Is he available? Can he do it?" I'm like, "Hell yeah, I'll do it." So, I had a couple of lines in it, and the Men in Black Two film. It was pretty good. Um, yeah, it's. Uh, can I tell you a bit of a uh, crazy story? Absolutely. So let's get back on the Fuse Fangoria Chainsaw Awards. Mm -hmm. uh, so during the awards, there was these bands playing. One of those was Red Hot, Red Hot, Red Hot Chili Peppers were in the audience. And okay. Anthony uh, Akitas, the lead Anthony. singer. Yep. Yeah. He was about four rows ahead of me sitting in a chair. Um, now click that in your brain. Now let's mm -hmm. flash back. I don't know how many years till I'm um, back in Detroit, uh, Eastern Michigan. I'm bouncing at a bar. Uh, bar was called uh, called the Nectarine Ballroom. This is right outside of Ann Arbor. And on Thursday nights they'd have like Wednesday nights they'd have band night. They had all these mm -hmm. great bands coming there. Uh, they had things like Fish. They had uh, Black Flag. Well, one of the nights. They had the Red Hot Chili Peppers come. This is before they were huge. They had that young following. Chili Peppers. Yeah, yeah. So they had they had that, and they had a stage and whatever. And so they asked us to all the bouncers. We had I was a head bouncer, 
they had to stay in front of the stands, the stage, and we were protecting against. We were uh, we were, had our backs to the mosh pit that was behind us. And we're getting the shit beat out of us by all these people in the mosh pit, and people were punching, were punching us and whatever. And uh, you know, once in a while, one of the guys would throw an elbow because someone would be freaking, you know, chomping on him or whatever, you know, stepping on him. After a while, Anthony Kita stop, stop the music. He goes, I want everybody to beat the fuck out of these bouncers. Next thing you know, there's a freaking brawl going on. I had, I had like, I had ten or fifteen bouncers. I had. Everyone was fighting for the rest of the night. You know, they, we, we, we quelled it. But later on, I had one of my guys got stabbed. Um, it was bullshit. Yeah, it was bullshit. And so, uh, they went after the show. They went down to the green room, and they were coming up. And guess who was waiting for them? All fifteen of us in the foyer. And they had their little hot chicks with them. They're walking it out. Like, yeah, you're not going anywhere. My buddy had flee sideways against the the wall. I had Anthony Akitas um, against the wall with my neck, my hand around around his neck, and we uh, we very much um, put them out the window or put them out the door uh, as quote nice as we could. Um, and they were like, and then and the funny thing about it. They, that, that was uncalled for what they did. So we didn't hit them, but we uh, we scared them pretty good. And then when we tossed them out, they said, yeah, you know what? You're always going to be a bouncer and we're going to be famous. Well, they became famous. So, But now let's flash forward to – Get a word in front award of show, and I And I see four four rows ahead of me. I see um, I see him and I go, hey. He goes, oh, congratulations, man. I said, good. I said, uh, do I look familiar? No, man, no. All right, cool, man. <laughs> they just left. Oh, that was it. That was it. So I, I was, there was a little more dialogue than that, but that was pretty much. I said, "Hey, you know, how you doing?" I said, "You know, I said something like, have yeah, we met before?'" I said, "Yeah, all right, really when?" I said, "Ah, oh, long time ago." I bet you know whatever. He didn't remember. So should have grabbed him, but yeah. No, I was like, I didn't do that. So, but anyway, you know, no, they have a history of that though on that. Uh, uh, Woodstock 99 documentary. They yeah. did something very similar with fire. They started, they came out and played it. They were told to go out there and, and keep people from starting fires. Um, they did like a, a candlelight visual thing. And uh, yeah. And then what they did is they came out there and played Jimi Hendrix fire, uh, which caused fires to start all over the place. So, oh, really? yeah. So I, I didn't, we didn't know that it just turned a huge brawl. I got some guys who got hurt and we were not very happy. Um, we didn't hit anybody, but we scared the living shit out of him. And I had that Akitas dude against the wall. So, and I think he saw Jesus a little bit. So, um, yeah, it was good. Nice. Well, Un- unacceptable. So that's, that's my story. So, but yeah. Before before we wrap up your, your film career here, uh, what was it like on set in costume? And I'm assuming with a lot of heat when you were filming Hills Have Eyes. Yeah. So that shot in Morocco. So um, if you, you know what Vegas heat is, right? You've been to Vegas, Vegas in the summertime. Oh, yeah. You know, it's like 110, 120 every day. Uh, it's, that's how Morocco is. And so we shot in a, in a stage. So they tried to had big fans on, not a lot of air conditioning. So I don't think it's a good thing or a bad thing, but uh, they always say I have a good face for prosthetics <laughs> because it likes to be covered up, I guess. Um, we'll take it but, a thing. No, no. So yeah. So, but my, my, my face is not oily. It doesn't, so I don't sweat a lot, you know, unless I'm working out, of course, but when I'm doing prosthetics and things like that. It doesn't really, lot. so I, I can handle it pretty well. It doesn't come off my face. Uh, like a lot of people are getting touched up and it doesn't happen. So I held up pretty well uh, with that, but there, um, we had a couple of things that are outside that it got really hot really quick. Yeah. And then you, sometimes you get rashes on your neck and things like that from that, yeah. things like that happening. It takes about three and a half to four hours to get on and yeah. on off. It takes about maybe an hour and a half to get off, but it goes quicker as you get into it. First, first days are always the longest and you're always, whenever you're doing prosthetics, you're always the first one there and most likely the last one to leave. Yeah. So those foo-foo actors that don't have any prosthetics and they just show up, do their stupid lines and they leave. <laughs> I'm teasing, but yeah. So, well, what was the one role that you wish you would have had that you almost got? Oh, um, tried out for and just didn't get. Yeah. So there, so I could tell you one story. Uh, 
So I was doing a movie called Undisputed with Ving Rhames and Leslie Snipes. So mm. um, we shot that in Vegas. <laughs> and, um, you know, when you're filming, a lot of times you uh, you have days off. My manager calls me in the middle of shooting, shooting and says, hey, uh, I understand you got tomorrow off. He goes, yeah, get your butt to Los Angeles. Um, you have an audition for Scorpion King with, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, The Rock's first film coming out, right? So it's his first starring role. Um, and, and I said, okay. And so I get to Los, I get, I drive four hours to get to, it was at Universal. And I go there and I read for the director and producer. They said, don't go anywhere. They go out of the room, come back with the rock. I read again. They said, good. Um, that's really good, Michael. That's really good. I said, oh, I said, thanks. Appreciate it. Got in the car, heading back on to one, 101 in traffic. Some guy pulls up next to me as we're going like five miles an hour. And he says, hey, I was in the audition after you and they were still talking about you. You're going to get that, man. I'm like, oh, thanks, man. I appreciate it. I get back to the set and everybody on the set is like going, uh, congratulations. I'm like, oh, I said, I, you, 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 um, I, here's, you, you booked the, the Scorpion King. I said, really? I said, I haven't heard anything. He goes, yeah, well, we're, we're going to be on the show next. And we, 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 you know, we, we, we heard that. I'm like, oh, well, cool. I called my manager. I said, you hear anything? He goes, yeah, they just, they just called me and asked for your, your schedule, what your availability is, what your, what your rate is, meaning how much you're going to, you know, what's your weekly uh, rate. And all that stuff. And I'm like, wow, this is going to happen. This is kind of cool. And so they had me go ride a horse. I did that. And uh, things looked pretty good. I mean, like really good. Right. There was no one else like there like me and all that stuff. And then uh, there were more talking and then it stopped. Done. Nothing. And then I heard from when I went back to the set of the movie I was doing, they said, yeah, we heard that Schwarzenegger made a call and knows the director and said, uh, Hey, uh, I want you to put my boy in Ralph Mueller. So Ralph Mueller got the role and I missed out. So, but Hey, I, I gave it a good, gave it a good run. So that was probably one role, one role I've, I've always want to play. I've always wanted to play. I always want to play is the bad guy in a James Bond film. Like, Oh, uh, you know, cool. I want to be the main bad guy with the James Bond film, like the right hand man. That guy that isn't, you know, that kills everybody. I love that that kind of character. So yeah, that yeah, <laughs> that'd be a really cool role to play. Yeah, so, I'm getting older now. I don't know if that's going to happen, but yeah, it'd be kind of cool though. But uh, yeah. you know, I'm writing, I'm writing a lot, and uh, got that screenplay option that's going to go into production next year and be a writer and producer on it, which is awesome. It's going to be shot in Detroit, some in Detroit and some in Los Angeles. Uh, it's going to be very cool. Um, called My Good Boy. I think you're gonna like it a lot. Yeah. So, yeah, just yeah. by a little bit of photos here, that that sounds pretty legit, and I'm I'm excited to see that. And yeah, it's, it's gonna be good. And and screw you, Arnold, for that. That was that was dirty. Um, <laughs> it's so okay. You were. Uh, That's Hollywood, right? It, you know, listen. If I if I was in his position and I had had my boy, you know, I want to get my boy into a film. I, he he, they, they don't know me, right? So he it's been the rock. Yeah, it could have been what you know. I just don't know. So you know, there's could probably it, some time. DJ boy, yeah, yeah. You just don't know. <laughs> and well, what what's the one role that you're you're most proud of? Looking back at your extensive resume of film. Oosh, um, well, I liked I like even though there's like not a lot of dialogue, you know, things like that. But as an there's a lot as an actor because actors it's not really being an actor is not all about the dialogue, right? Mm -hmm. So um, the Hills of Eyes, I loved because of the range of emotion from being incredibly vicious, uh, you know, to like when you have the baby and the baby's yeah. there, I'm holding the baby in the trailer. And the, you know, because baby doesn't know anything about being uh, what ugly is or what being scared is and things like that. And so it reached up and playing with my face. They really liked me. You know, <laughs> that was really a great dichotomy between what I look like, what the baby they're reaching and touching, and touching me during the filming. That was that was cool. Um, that I like. I love that because the range of emotions from being like a child to being totally vicious and just you know all that. Even the trailer scene and all that, just all good stuff. The other one is a TV show. Uh, of course, Charmed. I always like that. There's a huge mm -hmm. following there. I love the the Charmed fans are just so loyal. 
um, there's people with tattoos of me on their bodies that are charmed and bills of eyes and, and uh, Super Freddy, which is crazy. How, how cool is that? Uh, or crazy is that to see someone with ink of you? Yeah. The first time that happened, it was, uh, I was, I was at an autograph signing and some guy walked up and he goes, Hey man, I'm your biggest fan. I'm like, Oh, thanks man. I appreciate it. No, no, you don't understand, man. I'm like, I'm your biggest fan. I'm like, okay. Okay. I'm thinking my head. Okay. It's getting a little weird now. Yeah. Goes, I goes, I, dude, I want to show you something. I'm like, and he started reaching for his like shorts. I'm like, well, hold it, hold it. He pulls yeah. up and pulls his shirt off from his shorts. And it's a freaking huge thing of Pluto that he tattooed. So it was on okay. it. So it was really cool. Yeah. Yeah, that was cool. Then he had me sign my name and he got it tattooed uh, on there. And then, uh, but yeah, um, that's, you know, that's, that's pretty crazy. Um, the charm thing was pretty awesome. And then um, the other role that I'm proud of, I liked a lot is a character I played on Nash Bridges. I played officer Mike Willis from traffic. Oh, Don Johnson. Was, yeah. So that was a great, that was a great character theme. Yeah. It, that character fit like a glove. It had yeah. so much fun. Lots of, lots of cool dialogue. It just uh, got to work with Rulon Gardner, you know, the guy who beat the Russian yeah. dude Olympics. So yeah, he had, a, he had a, like a bit part in it. And so like that, it was, I pulled him over. He was riding his bicycle and I pulled over my motorcycle. I'm like, license registration, please. It's just a really funny scene. Just good stuff. You know, just funny stuff. Yeah. I love well, those kind of characters. Talk to us about a little bit about what you do now. You're a vice president of global sales at Lexi. To yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I know. So, um, so instead of waiting tables between gigs, I put my degree to work. So, um, yeah. I worked at, when I was an actor, I worked at a test laboratory in Culver city, you know, right there in Los Angeles testing consumer products. So, um, and it was all high tech type consumer products, uh, things from like operating systems like Microsoft or, maybe uh, HP computers, you know, laptops, you know, so I grew up with technology from the late eighties, the nineties, 2000. So when the internet came out, um, you know, and then when uh, things like uh, wireless technologies came out, you've yeah. heard of like uh, the ring doorbell and things like that. Well, yeah. ring doorbell fits in a, a technology space called IOT or the internet of things. IOT platform. Yeah. So, you know, I'm, yeah. So that's, that's what I play in is that space. So I worked at a place called NTS was an actor. And then, uh, and then I, I kind of stepped away from the acting and just focus on my writing and still got stepped in the business side of things. And I worked for uh, another company called Osram Sylvania. Then uh, I worked for a company called Leaderson. And then now this jumped over to this startup. Um, I've been here for six months uh, and I'm the global head of sales worldwide for a company called Lexi, which is an IOT platform company. So we're, we're a white label, like, uh, let's say this is a sensor here, right? So it's a little sensor, it's a smoke sensor, but it has no brand on it. So this is a, we, we would call this a, a white label product. So someone would buy this and then put, you know, put trip, trip company on there and trip sensor. Yeah. So we do same thing with apps. So white labeled app. So if you if you're a company that wants to get into the IoT space, uh, we offer yep. white label products like this. Uh, and we also offer white labeled apps and the cloud as well as all the back end and all the analytics. And so okay. I have all the sales for that. Yeah. And so I use all three names as a sales person because one, it carries some weight because of my history with as being an actor. A lot of people recognize me and say, Hey, you look familiar. Have we met? No, but I've probably been in your living room. That's what I always tell them. <laughs> and then uh and they always freak out by that but then you know it's a great it's a great way to sell right so it's, it's a good opening thing um and then so i use that because it separates there's a five billion michael smiths but there's only one michael bailey smith so that's that's why i use it and so i've built a reputation and a name that and i've built companies from uh zero to multi-million dollar companies in a very short period of time uh my last company i took i built it to four million four hundred million in about four years and so this company, I plan on doing that and not next four years, taking about three billion. We have that potential. So we'll see. But I'm still writing and I'm I just did a little film a little while ago called Miracle Desert. Um, yeah, so I'm going 90 miles an hour. So you getting uh, well and and Aaron tied in at uh central Michigan. So how, how cool is that to see him like almost following in, in your footsteps with how you've gone about the same thing? 
Oh yeah. It's, it's a, it's a blessing. Uh, he's better than me for sure. Better looking for sure. He's the kind of guy. So both my sons, my, uh, my, you know, they'll walk into a place and girls is like, they'll forget trying to order from, they'll just like pay attention to them. They only like take my order. It's all about them. I'm like <laughs> uh, I am here, you know, whatever. So, but yeah, he's, he's a pretty special guy. Uh, Army Ranger, you know, deployed, you know, multiple times and, you know, did other things disappear for a while, if you know what I mean. And, uh, um, you know, pretty special guy. Uh, and he got a preferred walk on at central Michigan. I, I helped him get that, you know, just promote, we put together a demo of him playing quarterback and working out with his coach. And, uh, and, you know, they called him the old man and he's there and he's, he's leading the, you know, he's helping uh, with a lot of leadership on the team. He's working to get, uh, to get some playing time. You know, it's going to take some time, but he'll get there. And then, uh, uh, what else? Um, uh, my younger son, he's at a community college in California. Um, he's six, five to 35. He's a tight end as well. So, yeah. So, uh, um, he's got some schools looking at him. We'll see what happens. So. Wow. That's, I would kill for that size. Jeez. Um, you well, know, I, let me I ask you this my, question. I told my, yes, sir. No, but, no, but I, just real quick, I, I told my boys, no, I said, listen, I don't care what you, I just, I told my boys, I said, I don't care what you do. I said, just do it to your best of your ability. And again, my key is don't do anything half ass. Don't do anything half ass. Yep. Other than that, you, the rest will take care of itself. It really will. It really will. So anyway, yeah, exactly. that was my words of advice. What you started with kind of, yeah. kind of booking in this. So what, at the end of the day, you, uh, you were showing me earlier how, how stout you are for for your age and how many more things you've got left to accomplish. But when someone and, and people will be talking about you, which is crazy to think about for, for anybody, 50, 100 years from now, what do you want your legacy to be? Um, first is that, uh, that I'm a good father. Uh, I want to, I want to be a great father to my boys. I know one's 24 and one's 20, but I always want to be there for them. You know, they're going to make their way, but you know, I'm there to help support them and both, you know, just, you know, I'm there to support them and help them anyway. And then two, two is I want to be known as a, um, a great guy, you know, I just really known as a great guy and a, a nice dude. Um, I, I, I was, I, sometimes I'll, I'll watch those motivational videos and I was watching something the other day about what people are taking a survey of what some like these older people are like in their nineties or hundreds, what do they regret the most? One of them is not taking enough time to enjoy life. Another one is not keeping in contact with your friends, you know, and all your friends that you meet along the way. And so I, I've been making it really a, a big effort on doing that is reaching out to some of the guys that I've known in the past, like old guy from the A second airborne named uh, John Paquette, crazy dude, love this guy to get, he's the only guy that I know, that could smoke a pack of cigarettes and still run six miles. Like there's nothing. I smoke a pack of cigarettes a day. The guy was just crazy, you know, him or another, you know, got the guys I've worked with just call them and say, Hey, how you doing? How's your family? You know? And they've always commented back, says, you know, Smitty, my nickname is Smitty half the time. And they said, you know, I, you know, I appreciate this call and you know, you've always been a great guy. And I, and that's all I really want. You know, that's all I, you, you really want to hear. Right. Uh, you know, yeah. the money and I'm getting, I'm just getting like, I got tears running down my face. I'm a big, big baby. But um, the money and things like that, all that stuff will come. I'm not worried about that. Of course, I want to make it, but I just about, I want to, that's just be known as a good guy and a good father. You know, yeah. And then, yeah and then, then, and then I, and that wrote it hard to the end, you know, yeah. let, 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 let nothing behind. I was re listening to one motivational guy and he says, Do you know where the cure for cancer is at right now? Do you know where the the secret formula is for light speed or uh do, do, do you know or like the, for anything the greatest inventions in the world you know they're at right now they're in the graveyard because people mm -hmm. are afraid to, to to take the next step to do anything mm -hmm. and i don't want to be like that i i want to i don't want to have my my dreams my, my everything left in the graveyard i want to i want to take those dreams and turn them into reality and that's just through hard work and planning right Never freaking give it up. That's deep. It's true yeah. though. It's true. And I, and I, I, when I heard that, I was like, "Holy shit!" That makes so much sense. Yeah. I'm not gonna let that happen. And wow. So, 
again, you will not find a video game on my phone or on my laptop. Yeah. I, I am, I am writing. Now I have nothing against people to do that. That's great. Do whatever when you, but imagine if you kind of, you know, use time to focus and, and enjoy your family and yeah, go freaking have a beer, get wasted yeah. every so often if you want to, and you know, go get, you know, have some fun with some women and whatever you need to do. But, you know, spend most of that time, though, you know, pushing yourself forward. Every day I try to do something towards my goal, little yeah. or small, every day. And then guess what happens after a week? Holy shit, look what I've done. After a month, holy crap, look how much more I've done. Mm -hmm. That's how you succeed. That Rarely will you find an overnight success. There'll be 20-year overnight successes, you know, something like that. It's going to take – it takes time. Rarely will that, that you know, that hot chick sitting on the – the stool in the ice cream shop get, shop get discovered by the producer who just happens to be driving by. That rarely happens. It's only you make you have success by putting in a lot of hard work every day and grinding and getting yeah, better. Yeah, you get that, that quick success. Does it sustain if you don't have that hard yeah. work? And it doesn't. Agreed. So. Agreed. Agreed. You see so many yeah. people like that. Yeah. What you mentioned about you know wanting to be known as a good guy. I mean, I, I can vouch for it. I can vouch for you taking time to for. My family, when my family met you uh, back in Atlanta, uh, you know, we walked away from talking to you and it was, wow, he, he's the nicest guy we've, we've interacted with at any of these these comic cons that we've been to and stuff. Um, so, I mean, and that was that is honest to God uh, what my wife, my daughter and I were saying when we walked away from talking thank to you. you. Thank you. Thank um, you. Definitely thank you for that. What final comments do you have for all of our listeners out there? You have another a lot of big questions here. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, um, you know, I uh, a year and a half ago I almost passed away. Um, I had a pulmonary embolism in both my lungs, um, big big blood clots, and the doctor said, "Listen, dude, I'm telling you right now, most people die from just one small one in one lung." You had two big ones in both lungs. Um, and he said, you know, and I, he said, he goes, we're, we're going to get you right. We're going to fix you, but you're a lucky dude. And that really made me think that, um, that you cannot take this, you know, th these moments for granted. You just mm -hmm. can't, you know, and enjoy life, man. Enjoy, enjoy your family, enjoy your friends, enjoy your girlfriends, you know, whatever, uh, and your loved ones and and then freaking go for your goals if someone says no say okay and come back to them even harder and smarter and better i can't tell how many times i've been told no about by so many things how many times i've failed but it's never a failure just learning and then like coming back better my first audition after i did nightmare on elm street i went to a commercial audition and the cast directors uh when i got in reading she says Hi. Uh, okay. Uh, do you have a day job? I said, yeah, I do. I said, I work at a uh, computer place. She goes, probably should keep that. And I walked out and I'm like, and I'm so freaking naive. I walked out and I go, I shut the door and I go, holy shit. She just freaking insulted me. And that I didn't come back in. I just, just pissed me off and it drove me in more. And that's what's happened to my whole life. I've been told no so many times. You just got to keep doing it. And that's, that's the thing is, is just don't give up on your dreams, man and enjoy life and enjoy your family, you know? Yeah. And, and when I was on, when I was in that, in that hospital in the emergency room, sorry again, in the emergency room, I'm laying there. Nurses would walk by, wouldn't look at me because I was basically dead man walking. No one would look at me. Uh, and I remember I, I said to myself, I call it text my, my I'm divorced now, but my wife then I text her and said, I love you. And I text my two boys and said, love you guys. Make sure you take care of your mom. And I, and I, I was, I was good. I got right with Jesus and uh, I was good. Cause I knew that if I, if I, if I'm dead right here, you know, during this time that I gave it all I had, I have no regrets. So that's, that's, and that's what, that's what I want you to, you know, to take away from this is that just, just have fun, man. And go for it. And enjoy every freaking moment. Just enjoy it. So no next opportunity. Yes. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Well, Be thank you from, from start to finish for this interview, for being transparent, vulnerable, open thank you. story on here. I'm a big baby. <laughs> uh, I, I appreciate it. And that's what this is all about. 
I cry, I cry the drop of hat. It's funny, like my first acting class, my, my, I took, I'm this big guy, you know, sitting there and the cat, the instructor gave me this, uh, acting coach gave me this scene that I had to cry. And like, I looked at him, really? I was crying like a baby. And he goes, boy, you're really close to your tears. I'm like, well, you know, there's a lot of things that happen. So <laughs> it's not, it's not hard. <laughs> so. The chat of the podcast where Super Freddy has tears. Coming down. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. Well, no, I, I appreciate it, folks. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Hopefully you've checked us out here on YouTube. Uh, if you're listening to us on uh, one of the podcast apps, Spotify, Apple, Amazon Music, definitely head over to YouTube. We're just starting up our YouTube channel with these new episodes in October. So definitely go over there. You got to see this. You got to see this awesome award he's got sit next to him, too. Um, so that's awesome. Yeah, you can only see it on the YouTube channel. This is a real thing. This weighs about freaking 30 pounds. It's heavy. Oh, it looks it's, like you can damage. Yeah. yeah. You, you hurt somebody with this. Well, folks, <laughs> that is all the time we have this week for the Shadows Podcast.